Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Conversations with Mark Becker, a podcast produced by Georgia State University. You can find this episode on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and Google Play, or watch it on YouTube. In this and future podcasts, I sit down with leaders who are shaping the future of higher education in America and beyond. We'll dive into the challenges and opportunities facing higher education and explore policies and practices that show promise of a brighter future. I hope that you'll find these conversations stimulating and thought-provoking, and if you do, please subscribe so that you will not miss future episodes. Again, I'm your host, Georgia State President Mark Becker, and today my guest is Dr. Risa Palm, Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs at Georgia State. Welcome, Risa. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Uh, Risa, you and I have known each other for 15 years. We've been working together for the last 10, you as Provost, me as President. Uh, But for all of those 15 years, you've been a Provost or a Chief Academic Officer having a system-level job when you were at SUNY. But what does a Provost do? What... Describe the job for our listeners. Yeah, the provost is the chief academic officer, and so the provost is the person who is responsible for everything academic about a university, uh, whether we're talking about curriculum, um, learning, student admissions, uh, usually, um, research, faculty, Mm -hmm. faculty development, um, and also particularly, I think, planning for the future of universities because as society is changing, universities are changing also, and the university needs to be forward-looking, and the provost needs to be somebody who's helping helping with the deans and helping with the planning. Well, and you, you mentioned society changing, and you know you got your PhD in 1972, so you, you've seen some changes in, in higher education in your career, and you know today you're well known across the country, certainly among the large public institutions. You've been a leader, uh, chair of the Council of Academic Affairs and the American Association of Public and Land Grant Universities. But to my mind, you've been a leader since the very beginning because when you started in this business, it wasn't so easy for women. And I'm not saying it's easy now, and we'll get into that. Uh, But uh, as I understand it, you were the first woman ever tenured in the geography department at the University of California, Berkeley. Yes. And the the second woman to be president of the American Association of Geographers. So could you tell us a little bit of what was it like back in those days and, you know, to be really a pioneer, to be one of the first women academics in your discipline and uh, at, at a very high level, you know, at the top universities, in your, your association? Truly, it didn't feel like I was a pioneer. It, it, it felt it felt just it, it felt that I was just doing things that are that were very normal. But I'm very much a product of my generation. Um, in my generation, um, my generation, <laughs> uh, we, we, women were not admitted to some of the elite universities. In fact, I was out of graduate school before Harvard started admitting, the, or any of the Ivy League started admitting women students as freshmen at all. I felt it was ironic when I got to be Dean of Arts and Sciences at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. I, if I had been a student of my age, I would not have been admitted there as a freshman. So things have changed a great deal. Um, but it, it, uh, it, it has been um, helpful, I think, to, uh, to try to promote other women as, as, as I've gone along. Women bring a different perspective in, in many ways. In geography, for example, many of the questions that we were asking, that geographers were asking, did not look at the entire household, the entire family, and therefore didn't understand really why people were located where they were, why, why, mm-hmm. why people were changing their locations, and these are geographic questions. So to take a, wom- a woman's perspective on that was a very important thing to do. And I think women have changed the field of geography. I also think that women in university administration have changed the natures of, un- of the university as well. Absolutely. I want to dive deeper into that, but first I want to go back to those early days, the 70s and the early 80s, because I certainly remember encountering encountering faculty colleagues um, as late as 1985, 1986, who said in openly in faculty meetings, we shouldn't hire women. Uh, that you know they they would get pregnant and have babies. They wouldn't be regular full time faculty. They wouldn't um, carry their own weight, et cetera, et cetera. Did you encounter those those kinds of biases? You know, very explicit. Uh, certainly so. Um, when when I was at uh, um, the University of California, there was a very senior faculty member there who 
used to look down when he would encounter me in the hall. I wasn't sure if that was because I was a woman or because I used numbers. I'm not. I'm not sure what it was. I, would, I, I was so something you were a he quan didn't. As well. yeah, I was a quantitative <laughs> geographer. It, it was something he didn't approve of in, in, in any case. And and certainly so when when women were so few in geography. Um, I, I certainly can recall a great deal of sexism on the part of, right. of some of the senior faculty. On the other hand, that was also a time when affirmative action had turned from simply being a civil rights issue to really extending to women mm -hmm. in, the, in the 1970s. And so there was a great deal of attention to that by uh, various universities, and, and that, that was an important part of the the, the, the timing of, of my career as well. So as we look at your career and, you know, you go on from uh, being a tenured faculty member, you know, hugely successful as an academic geographer and you're, you're, again, president of your own association, uh, but then eventually you go into leadership roles, become a dean, become a provost. Actually, you were, I think, a dean twice, dean of a graduate school as well as a dean of College of Arts and Sciences. Did you have role models along the way? How, how difficult was climbing that ladder, you know, where you're basically the chief academic officer of an institution? You've been at three different, in, uh, at one system and two institutions. Uh, did you have help along the way? Were there role models, or did you basically, were you alone in the wilderness as you climbed this ladder? I absolutely had help along the way. I had help along the way all through my career, whether it was from men or women that, that were very helpful. Um, in, in geography, certainly my colleagues, by and large, at Berkeley were immensely helpful to me in acculturating me into what it meant to be a geographer. And certainly when I, when I went into administration at Colorado, my mentors were, of course, primarily men because those were the, the people that were in leadership, but were immensely helpful to me in, in advising me and, and giving me good life advice. Um, I, and I, I would say that it's important that we give a hand to, to anyone that's, that, that is, that's coming along into these leadership roles, that mentorship is important. Now, there were national role models that I didn't know personally, right. but that, that I, I looked to, and, and, and the fact that they existed actually provided help to me, that I, I could think about what they had done, and they, they provided a kind of mentor, mentorship to me as well. Purely geographers or outside of geography also? No, definitely outside of geography. I wish I could, I could say to you that I, I've known Ruth Bader Ginsburg for a long time, but as, I, I, as I've thought about her career and what she has done for mm -hmm. women in the United States, this is the kind of person, the, the kind of people that really have made a difference to, to all of us mm -hmm. and to the, to the nation, to, to totally. making the nation stronger. Okay, so we've, we've gotten stronger, we've made progress, but I don't think we're done by any stretch. I think women still face boundaries and hurdles that uh, men don't face. And so, and I know you share that and you're, you're a huge advocate for women. So look into the future. Where, where, do you, where do you think we need to really focus within our universities to make sure that women have a level playing field? and uh, get the opportunities to not only be faculty members, to be leaders and you know, rise up and be provosts and presidents as you have. Yeah, I, I think that um, what we've been, what has gone on is we've been evolving towards more equality uh, of women in a variety of fields. Um, when Again, when I was very young, there were very, very limited fields that women could go into. In fact, in high school, one thought of being a a secretary, a teacher, or a nurse. In college, there were a limited number of majors that seemed reasonable for women. Mm -hmm. um, and that this is changing, but it has not completely changed. We still have areas where women are very commonly found and areas where women are not commonly yeah. found. And I, I think women can contribute, after all, more than half of the population can contribute to all areas of, of academia. I think in looking towards the future, we need to have universities that are friendly to all people, family friendly, mm -hmm. that the career path is not necessarily set on the basis of what we thought a man could do, a man of the 1920s, a man of the last century could do, but instead is friendly to the timing of a career, in other words, childbearing, child raising, for both men and women, uh, is important to integrate in, into the career, and that will make the, the university a place where women can thrive. That's terrific, and you've had an amazing career, and certainly appreciate the uh, more than decade that you'll serve as Georgia State's provost as you prepare to return to the faculty, but 
Uh, when you say return to the faculty, you're serious. So uh, share with our listeners what you plan to do next. Oh, you're very kind to ask me that. <laughs> I, I, I've, I've be, I was interested in earthquake hazards when I um, was more when I, when I was spending more time as a faculty member, um, and and what earthquake hazards really are is a way in which people are understanding the environment and responding to the environment. It seems to me that the existential uh, problem that we're facing right now is one of climate change. And so I'm terribly interested in how people understand climate change and how we can better communicate, how we can better communicate science, how we can better communicate the reality of this very, very serious problem. Well, and I know, I think there's a, maybe a book in the offing? Yes, yes, yes. Absolutely. South Florida, Terrific. Thank well, you. Now, you've had an amazing career, and thank you so all you've done for Georgia State, and really for all of higher education, particularly as a, um, as a leader overall, but particularly as a pioneer for women of your generation, as you said. No, it's, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity, yeah, and well, it's, been a, it's been a pleasure to be here. Well, Wonderful to well, be it's, here. It's been, been a great team. Really enjoyed it. This has been Conversations with Mark Becker, a podcast produced by Georgia State University, and you've been listening to a conversation with Dr. Risa Palm, Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs at Georgia State. To hear future conversations with leaders who are shaping the future of higher education, you will find Conversations with Mark Becker on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and Google Play, as well as video on YouTube. Thank you for listening, and remember to subscribe so that you will not miss future episodes. Goodbye for now.